Good day. What I'd like to do here is take you through the CISSP certification. Now that is a certified information system security professional from ISC squared. Now in 1989 a few organizations joined forces to form the International Information System Security Certification Consortium otherwise known as ISC squared. It was the first ISO 1702 certification that was available. Um, it means that the, the, the ISO states that the certification has to be um, go through a d domain specific um, the exam is separate and marked separately from the organization itself um, meaning that it is totally independent. There's currently more than 80,000 certified CISSP world, worldwide. And if you want to see the advantages of having a CISSP, if you don't have that, there's some good material at the icsquare.org website. Now, you need some experience to write this exam. You need valid experience, which includes system security related work performed or work that requires information security new knowledge and involves direct application of that knowledge. For example, if you want to write the CISSP, you need five years experience in at least two of the ten domains. Or you may substitute one year if you've got a graduate degree or a certification in line with the CISSP, for example, um, Security Plus or CISA, CISM or any one of those. Now the CBK or the Common Body of Knowledge is a collection of topics. No one owns that and it's not copyrighted. The security professional should be proficient in the CBK. And also it's a living document, meaning that um, if the time I wrote the exam, um, I need to keep up to date to make sure that I keep up to date with all the changes in technology and it is updated regularly. Now the approach from our training is that we don't teach the exam. It is a framework for you to understand where you lack in, uh, skills and knowledge. You can never uh, train the exam and also if you have places that say listen we're the only official training organization and so on you need to understand that the common body of knowledge is not owned by anyone uh, although it's developed by IC squared and it's up to you to ensure that although um, many of the training material from different vendors and so on goes through many of the topics every month every week there are new material coming down and you need to subscribe for example NIST which I'll just touch on later you need to make sure that you're up to date to all the new training materials as well if it's part of your job career and life you'll, you'll understand it is actually quite um, I think simple to pass if you've got the experience and the knowledge now what kind of certifications are there available from from, from ISC squared first and foremost the, the golden certification is the CISSP which is a certified information system security professional goes with 10 domains you have the SSCP, SSCP which is a system security certified practitioner and they also uh, there's seven domains it's basically as far as I'm concerned a subset of CISSP but it's for a different kind of person, a person that sits at the coal face, a guy that sits at a firewall, um, antivirus, uh, help desk and, and etc. You have the certified accreditation professional, I'll go through that in a little bit detail. The latest on, on the horizon from IC squared is the CSSLP which is a certified secure software lifecycle professional and you'll see as well when we actually touch on a couple of things that your biggest risks these days are from people that don't develop properly. Even Microsoft has in time told the programmers to go back to um, basics instead of um, so many of many of the programs written, the bugs, the buffer overflows, the the um, time of check, time of you use COVID channels, which I'll touch on later. Uh, those were all due to programmer error. Um, after you've completed your CISSP, you may select to do a, a, a stream, which is a specialization stream, for example, engineering, management, and also architecture. So depending on what you want to do in the future, you, have, you can select one or more of those to add to your CISSP. Now, the CISSP domains includes things like access control, 
telecommunication and network security, a big, big domain. And if you don't have the experience, it's quite a difficult domain to get under your belt. For example, if you're a lawyer with legal and some other um, backgrounds and you want to do this, information security governance and risk management, um, quite a big domain and a new domain, uh, not a new domain, it's been changed, but I mean a new focus point worldwide on corporate governance and risk management. Software development security is cryptography, which I find is actually one of the easier domains because it's theoretical. So once you know it, it's a bonus. Um, I'll touch on that explaining some of the detail. There's security architecture and design, which is more uh, theoretical as well, formal models and so on. Operation security, the guy sits at the coalface uh, at the bridge, looks at patch management and these kind of things. Uh, physical security in data centers and so on overlaps from the physical domain as well. We have BCP and DRP or otherwise business continuity and disaster recovery planning. One of the domains when we do mock exams I find that this is the most difficult domain for the users due to the fact that they don't have normally most of the guys have practical experience in BCP and DRP. There's legal regulations, compliance and investigations. The old uh, for the guys who actually wrote many years ago, rewriting or that you started looking at it, it used to be called law and ethics. However, it's been adapted as well to look at things like forensics, first responder, um, and more of the evidence life cycle as well. And then finally, there's a physical or environmental security domain. Um, fairly a small domain, but um, concise in the sense of it has to form part of a perimeter into your security environment. The SSCB domains, I don't want to go into detail, but just to actually show you what each of the other certification has. We have access control as a domain, analysis and monitoring, that's more for the antivirus. If I can give you an example, monitoring of logs, you've got cryptography, uh, you've got malicious code, malware, hoaxes, um, coding practices as well, where the guys write code within your environment, networks and telecommunication, risk, response and recovery. For example, when something goes wrong, how do you actually react to that and how do you make sure that your incident management is actually working within the bigger picture as well and then finally security operations and administration help desk environment for example then if you look at the certification and accreditation professional um, this is more to do with the accreditation on systems um, processes cryptography um, and this is the understanding of the purpose of certification. Why do we do that? Initiation of the system authorization process when the process is submitted for a certification process, the certification phase, the accreditation phase, and then the continuing monitoring phase. So if you've got a process in an organization that has to go to certification, for example, encryption, if you work for a, a, a bank or a vendor that requires input and output into Visa or MasterCard, which is PCI uh, DSS standard, you need to actually make sure that you can prove that you are monitoring your systems adequately and continuously. Right, ISS AP or the architecture side is specialization after you've got your CISSP. We can look at things like in more detail and more in depth access control systems and methodology, the cryptography, physical security integration, requirements analysis and security standards and guidelines and criteria. This again, we need to start looking at, hey, uh, we look at ISO 27000, for example, as a, as, a, as a standard that we can actually look at. How do we implement it? What do we do as measurement criteria? What do we do as auditing and implementation thereof? Then find next step, technology related, BCP and DRP, uh, which is business continuity and planning and disaster recovery planning. How does what you have to do from an architecture point of view to make sure that my BCP and DLP is adequate. Uh, do I do a change? Who gets notified? Is it backup? Is it training? Um, Etc. Then also finally, in that architecture, there's called telecommunication and network security, but more detail, but the impl implementation within enterprise to enterprise architectures. You have the engineering side, which is more government in America based, Department of Defense, for example. You have certification and accreditation. You have system security engineering, technical management, and US government information assurance regulations. So not very applicable in South Africa. However, in the uh, bigger uh, picture, 
um, a very worthwhile certification to have as well if you if you go through that because it actually allows you to look outside and look at the Department of Defense. The management one, uh, the management um, specialization where you look at enterprise security management practices, how would you integrate information security, audit, uh, the group risk office for example, how do you communicate in the integration and communication, enterprise-wide system development security. Often you'll find that within huge corporates and enterprises that you have your ad hoc development of software and this is trying to pull that together to make sure that everything is managed. Law investigation, forensics and ethics, what do you do as an organization, uh, making sure that the data of clients are adequately secured. If something wrong, so what forensic steps do you have to do? And then also from an ethics point of view from staff and management. Overseeing compliance of operation security, part of the management process. And then finally in that specialization stream, the understanding of business continuity planning, PCP and DRP, and also continuity of operations planning. Now, let me go a little bit detail into the CISSP. In the access control, we'll look at things like control of access to resources using concepts, technologies, and techniques based on security classification. Very important, the classification of objects and subjects. Objects being items like files, data sets, subjects, people normally. However, an object like an application, maybe a service application, can also be a subject because it may execute things, processes and functions um, using um, a logon process. Then also the design, coordinate, evaluate, penetration testing, part of access control. We need to design, coordinate and evaluate vulnerability testing. Now there's a huge difference between penetration testing and vulnerability testing. Design the implementation and evaluate access control technologies ranging from physical to logical, um, how are passwords managed for example, identify and respond to security breaches, all part of process of that. In telecommunication and network security we'll go through things like secure data communications. How do I ensure that the data is delivered securely without anybody affecting the confidentiality, the integrity and the availability of that data? We look at trusted paths from an application, from a client and server point of view. We can establish secure multimedia communications between client and server, for example. Even from the point of view of looking at your biggest risk these days, there's this huge risk in organization, for example, instant messaging. We need to look at components thereof. We need to control potential attacks. And how do we do that? We will look at intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems, the benefits, the costs, the because what we do in this environment, when we look at risk analysis, we need to make sure that our expenditure is less than the exposure of our risk. Remote access control into environment, uh, what technologies are used, what hardware and software components can be used. Information security governance and risk management, quite a nice big domain. You need to understand the goals and missions and objectives of the organization. If you don't know how that fits in and what it means, it's very difficult to actually design your architecture. Governance development, how do we look at what types of governance requirements do we look at? And also from this we look at standards like Sarbanes-Oxley for example, ITIL, FIRM, um, Microsoft Operation Framework for example, which is the implementation of, of ITIL. Um, we look at the confidentiality, the integrity and availability, the, the fundamentals of the security triad. But then also what I would like you to do is when you look at any keyword within while studying, you need to look at things like risk against that keyword. For example, if I take now confidentiality, what's my risk to confidentiality? What's my threat actually? My threat, the, 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 the threat against confidentiality. If anything happens, it will be disclosure integrity, modification and availability could be destruction for example. Then also defense in depth and single point of failure within an organization. This is when you look at your critical systems in your organization and then also the domino effect. If one thing falls over what does it affect? Security policy development as a security professional what I do often is when you go to an audit or a review you make sure that you have the 
policies, the security policies of the organization, because that's what measure what people do and defines the, com the, the, the consequences for non-compliance. Does the organization have an information security forum? How does it work? What does it do? Then, very important factor here, server level agreement. Um, what, what needs to be done? Uh, how does it affect multiple parties, upstream and downstream? Procurement processes. Huge fraud takes place usually in a procurement process. What can we do about that? What mitigating controls do we need to understand? Outsourcing and co-sourcing. Can you outsource security? Very good question. Risk management and business impact analysis. Now, what I also do here is when we look at business impact analysis, there are a few ways of looking at analysis. Do you have um, qualitative quantitative risk analysis around this? So how does this dovetail into this? Incident management and reporting processes. What, this, what are the steps? You need to understand what are the steps. We go through that and how it actually reports back into the organizations. What's, how do you actually look at lessons learned, for example? Data classification. Ask yourself a question. Do you have data classification in your organization? If you don't, you don't have security because you don't know where to start. And also initiate and support identity management. When you look at staff, access to resources and things like that. At the final point here, certification and accreditation for risk management, uh, touching on that. What about ethics? We need to look at professional et ethics. Specifically here, um, and also with the law and ethics or the legal regulation and, and, and investigation section, it's important to understand ethics, especially writing the CISSP exam, you need to know the canons of the ethics of CISSP as published by IC squared. Security assessments, how does it work? What types of assessments are there? Architecture roadmap, you need to look at it from a corporate point of view. Look at my departments, my, my users, who's involved. And also understand the business impact of information security and risk management. How does that tie up into the bigger picture? Then the next se section we'll touch on is the software development lifecycle. When do you have to look at security when you do your software development? Which phases and where does it fit in what phase and what do you have to do? Because normally it's usually an afterthought. Write the application ad hoc and then boom, we need to understand and actually patch security after as an afterthought. Secure programming and coding go through different uh, types of uh, languages, levels, um, and then also what risks are there, for example, all the bad things that can happen, buffer overflow, noop attack, um, part of the change control processes, what do you need to do? Also, we need to look at and understand databases, warehouses, data mining. Expert systems such as artificial intelligence, neural networks, you need to understand that and go through it. Application vulnerabilities and threats. Now, your biggest risk these days is not from the operating system, contrary to what a lot of people believe, but at your application level and also often more so from a web point of view. Now, what do you have to do from a risk mitigation point of view to make sure those threats are managed? Then cryptography. A very nice section because you either know it or you don't know it. It's not, it's it's not uh, alchemy. There are things like asymmetric, symmetric, and hash functions. You need to know the algorithms. For example, DES, Data Encryption Standard. What is that? Is that symmetric or asymmetric? RSA, um, Algamol, Diffie-Hellman, etc. So once you know that, very very easy domain. Digital signatures. How does that work? Non-repudiation. That means that I cannot deny that I've read and received the mail, non-repudiation. Steganography, hiding something in plain sight, where you use, for example, images, JPEG, AV files, audio video files, to hide data without changing the size, and you can only pick it up using, uh, for example, hash functions and so on. Email security, different kind of email security, PGP, SMIME, um, implementation thereof and usage. Also the public key infrastructure, looking at things like X509, the certificate, all the attributes that you need to know. Kerberos, which is a ticket-based authentication system. 
Um, there's different versions. We'll discuss the version 4 and 5, the limitations and risks of the older versions. And also then finally in this section, cryptanalysis. What type of attacks can you do against the algorithms, the data, the users, etc. like that. Security architecture and design. Um, theoretical domain. Theoretical concepts of security models. We look at confidentiality and integrity models. For example, Bieber, Clark Wilson, Bella Padula. Now, if you haven't heard any of those, that is where uh, I think um, when I wrote my exam in uh, 1997, it, it was one of my um, domains which I really battled with, although um, quite a few of the books that we do recommend uh, going through these topics and so on it was, was a, a lifesaver for me. We will look at the components, components of the security evaluation models. Here, these things are, for example, the European based, the American based, and the international based. Architecture, the impact of the architecture, the design, curve channel. I mentioned earlier time of check, time of use. For example, if I change my password on a Friday, I've asked my password to be changed on a Friday because I forgot it. I leave work before they change it. They change it after I've left and I only come back on Monday. So I've got two days where my password's not being used and people can actually use a script to attack all the users in the organization which may have a default password. If help desk has the weakness, like most help desks uh, in practice we find, to give a user a default password that has to be changed when he logs on again. State attacks, emanations, radio emissions, the controls there are, for example, uh, Tempest, maintenance hooks, what are those, what are the risks, the trusted computing base, my reference models, my kernels, these are keywords that you have to understand that we are going through. And also from an operation security point of view, that is where the guy sits at a uh, desk, at a bridge in a large organization, at an ISP or a mainframe environment. We need to look at employee resource protection. The need to no, or least privilege, or the need to have, where everybody who has a dying to have, they want to get access to all data. High availability, how do we make sure from a disaster recovery point of view, redundancy issues. Um, for example, raids, raid 1, 0, 10, um, etc. Need to go through and know all those theoretical items. Administrative management control, these are issues that you need to go through as well. Um, for example, change control procedures and those formal things. How do we respond to attacks? Integration into the incident management system. Patch management, part of the operation security. And then finally, configuration management, also baseline shifting as a threat. Baseline shifting is exactly when you develop something, you implement the solution, it is secure, but over time, changes are made to make life easier for people and you lose the security environment. Now, BCP and DRP is one of the domains people tend to battle with, purely because of the fact that they have very little opportunity to have exposure to BCP and DRP. And what we go through is the project scope, the business impact analysis and risk analysis. And once you can see here, it overlaps from other domains again. We're looking at now risk management. The elements of BCP and DRP need to go through the response, the notification and personnel safety. Communication, logistics, these are just part of the attributes, the elements. Business resum resumption planning, damage assessments, the triage, what do I get rid of? And finally, restoration. BCP and DRP, critical there. Training of staff, uh, uh, also continuous tests. That's part of the training as well to make sure that our BCP and DRP tests are successful. And then the maintenance process of updating those plans. Law and ethics, also now known as the legal regulations, investigations and compliance. We need to understand the common elements of international laws. Um, for example, you might have a European American based, you might have mixed law or religious law. You need to understand all those. Understand and support investigations. Now this is from a first responder point of view to make sure that when things happen, your data, that the evidence that you collect is trustworthy and sufficient, complete, reliable and usable. And it has to go through those laws of evidence. You have to understand forensic procedures. Now, and finally here in this section as well, um, the ISC squared code of ethics. Very simple, need to understand and, and learn those because you need to know what are my ethics? What do I go through 
for the certification that I want. Finally, the physical and environmental security considers things like site design and requirements, protections and securing of hardware, software licenses, the physical securing, logical securing, the monitoring thereof, perimeter security and internal security support. Now physical security controls uh, covers many things like uh, my perimeter around my building for example, how high should that be, my lighting, how high should that be, my uh, high voltage um, and, and uh, alternating control, my air conditioning systems. These are many things that it actually covers through um, fire protection, um, types of fire protection devices uh, and uh, for example uh, types of fires uh, A, B, C, D and K you need to understand and, and know what, what they're used for. Then the examination has changed from a location based organized by different companies to an online exam hosted by Pearson View. Now if you want to see Pearson View the website is there PearsonView.com previously you had to wait for an organization organized location, which may be only once or twice a year. Now, the CISSP consists of 250 questions, SSCP of 125. The specialization streams, AP, 125 questions, engineering, 150 questions, management, 125 questions. The accreditation, the certification accreditation exam, also 124 questions. Each question contains four multiple answers with one most appropriate answer. Now, each con exam contains 25 questions set for research purposes alone, which means that uh, testing the waters out there, several versions of the exam is available, as in it is random questions. You require 700 points out of 1,000 to pass. Some questions are weighted, so some questions do actually um, take longer to answer and, and, and actually counts more. Results will be available within a few minutes after pressing your last enter key. It used to be about four to six weeks, and I usually say candidates will be audited, not can be audited. Will be audited meaning um, they go through your CV and making sure that your those are all correct. And if you want more information, um, we have a few ways of doing it. You can actually get part of the uh, communication group. We send out a lot of uh, information bits and making sure that you're up to date. Uh, we've got an instructor-led bootcamp style, very interactive, uh, quite hard. Uh, mock exams, uh, very good interaction. E-learning, you can do it online and also a DVD which is now in a USB based masterclass that you can actually uh, obtain and actually go through all these uh, slides and do some uh, mock questions. You can contact SACS at training at SACS.co.za at the telephone numbers down there or at the website.